On this episode of Skeptico, Alex talks with Crop Circle researcher and author, Suzanne Taylor. Hold on, hold on. Let me add a little update to this episode. It's now October 16th, 2014. And, you know, soon after publishing this episode, I started to get a lot of feedback from you Skeptico listeners. You folks really keep me straight. I really appreciated that. People started tearing apart the whole crop circle phenomena, some of the claims that I had kind of stumbled into and not adequately researched. I totally have to take the blame for that. So you guys kind of gently nudged me towards the evidence, and it didn't take much. The evidence is really pretty substantial and has been out there for a while. Again, something I could have, should have known But I think the best evidence suggests that crop circles are a man-made phenomena. And as far as claims about paranormal activity surrounding the making of and being in crop circles, well, you know, I don't know. That's a separate phenomena that really has to be treated differently. First, we have to separate out the fact that it's not, as near as we can tell, a paranormal phenomena. The best evidence suggests that these things are man-made by normal means. I got the story wrong. Fortunately, as I've experienced time and time again, Skeptico is kind of a self-correcting process. There's enough smart people listening to this show that if I get something wrong, they tell me. So thanks for that. I may do a follow-up show on this. I have been talking to Suzanne Taylor. It hasn't been a pleasant conversation. I called her up and told her, hey, I got this story wrong. What are you doing? What are you telling me? To her credit, she stood up to my challenges and presented her case. But in the end, it just doesn't make any sense. And the people involved just don't seem credible. And I think anyone who's looked at this very long comes to the same conclusion. As soon as you start saying, this one's man-made, this one's man-made, oh, I think this one's real, oh, no, that one's man-made, I I just think you have to give up and say, okay, the best evidence suggests that they're man-made by normal means. Move on. And that's what I'm doing. But for posterity's sake, I'm leaving the original episode (laughs) that I broadcast. Here goes. Stay with us for Skeptico. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sakaris, and on this episode of Skeptico, we're going to explore crop circles, a topic I'm rather embarrassed to say that until this episode, I really didn't know a lot about. And I think in a way, my lack of knowledge speaks to the general Skeptico experience for me, and that is when there's a controversial topic Even though I've explored so many of them, I really do get suckered into the skeptical perspective so much of the time. And so it was with crop circles. I mean, I knew there was something to it. I had read enough to know that there's actually some scientific evidence that the crops that were a part of this phenomena were showing some different properties than than ones that were not. But I don't think I had allowed myself to really grasp the significance of this phenomena. And I think the reason I didn't is the reason that we so often don't want to go there with these kind of things. And that is that it's so unsettling vis-a-vis the worldview that I've grown accustomed to. I mean, I can get to the point where I can accept the reality that somehow there's this other consciousness out there that is using advanced technology to visit us from beyond. And this technology and consciousness clearly seems to be mutilating animals and abducting people. That's just where the evidence leads. I don't know how any reasonable person can come to a different conclusion. But when it comes to crop circles, I guess they were just a little bit too new agey for me to really fit them into my expanded consciousness worldview. But to heck with that, gotta follow the data wherever it leads. And in this case, I found a good leader. I hope you enjoy my interview with Suzanne Taylor. I did. Today we welcome filmmaker Suzanne Taylor to Skeptico. Suzanne is here to talk about her film, What on Earth? Inside the Crop Circle Mystery, and tell us about her experience researching the crop circle phenomena. Suzanne, thanks so much for joining me. Welcome to Skeptico. 
Oh, Alex, I'm honored. You have a lovely reputation, and I've listened to a bunch of your shows, and uh, you're you're a good guy. <laughs> oh, thanks. That's so nice to hear. You know, this movie of yours, it's been out for a couple of years, but it's still extremely relevant. It's ex it's also received very high praise from all sorts of well-known folks. Tell us a little bit about how you became involved in this research. I get the impression from watching the film that you've compiled a lot of these interviews over many, many years. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of the film? Well, I uh, actually, you know, I'm not a filmmaker who went out and found a subject. I was deeply involved in uh, the crop circle phenomenon uh, and was so taken by how it could affect mass consciousness that um, I kind of made a vow <laughs> that if I was going to do anything unique with my life, um, which has always really been about raising consciousness one way or another, that's all the kind of projects and events that I've produced, uh, but if I was going to do something truly unique that no one else was going to do, I was going to tell the world about crop circles. Uh, not that we know where they're coming from. Uh, the only thing we can say definitively is, not us. <laughs> uh, of course, that's hoaxing aside. We know there's, you know, a, a, just as in every category of life, there are, there are the, the terrorists in the political world. We have the hoaxers in the crop circle world that keep us on our toes. But hoaxing aside, we have a, a, a genuine mystery. And if anybody were looking at the evidence, you would see that the evidence points to the fact that we can't make these things. And even though the rational mind says, oh, come on, people go out and stomp them. But when you take material into the laboratory and you get biological changes to the plants and chemical changes to the soil inside crop circles with real, you know, experiments done in, with, with real scientific protocol, then, you know, you, you heads up. Uh, it's worth paying attention to. It opens us to mystery. It opens up to what's beyond this. Who knows? I mean, really, we're so definitive, you know, being skeptical. Oh, no, uh, anything beyond 3D reality here, we're very skeptical about. Well, why? Why not be curious? Much more propitious, you know, that lets new stuff come in. And uh, so, uh, you know, my, my involvement with the circles went back to the fact that I was producing events and projects that had to do with consciousness. And the circles just came along as another uh, topic, another subject matter that, that, that you know, was, was intriguing. But it was so intriguing uh, that I got, you know, more and more pulled into it. I went to England to visit the circles. Um, I, uh, uh, you know, was was... was part of that whole community over there and there is one you know the circles are focused in england they're they're in 40 or some odd other countries as well but you have this little area in england where you know every growing season every summer you're going to get crop circles and it's a tourist attraction it's a whole world over there and i became part of that world i would speak at the conferences i would write pieces about them um, just as uh, people from all over the world gather in England every summer. We call ourselves croppies, uh, and we are the people who write the books and get the information out and take the pictures and what have you. And there's a little community uh, of us, and then we go back home to all the various countries we come from and, and spread the word. So, you know, in the course of all of that, I said, well, how do you really spread the word? You make movies. And I had been an actress. I was not unfamiliar with the, the world of, of uh, film. And so I just stepped over to the other side of the camera and I said, okay, I'm going to get movies to happen. And indeed, I, I have done that. Actually, there was an earlier film uh, 10 years ago called Crop Circles Quest for Truth. I was the executive producer of that one. I put it together. And uh, somebody who had won an, uh, had an Academy Award nomination as a documentary filmmaker for that uh, film, Waco, it's one of the biggest documentaries ever until Michael Moore came along. And... Uh, so he, he was fascinated by the circles, and so he was the actual filmmaker of that first film. But then I, I, was, I put together that shoot. I knew more about the phenomenon than he did. We were in England for a 10-week shoot. And uh, I, uh, he was doing a, a, a kind of history of the crop circles. Uh, and when that was finished, I thought, you know, there's another film here, uh, The Passion of the Crop Circles. Why are these people... Like me, although I hadn't given up my life, many of those uh, people who are part of that crappy world have actually given up 
careers to go and you know be crop circle people, and why? And they're fascinating people, mavericks, interesting people, uh, mathematicians, uh, brilliant geometers. What, what, you know, what, what, what's the story here? And I knew the story because I knew all these people. So I knew who had the best stories to tell. I knew who was credible. And um, so I, I, I over, uh, it took me six years to make the movie. I would return each summer, shoot some more. Uh, and, um, and then we, the movie actually came out in 2009, the end of 2009, but it is what you would consider an evergreen. There's one reference in it to a, 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 an event that actually has happened. So when I say it's going to happen, mm, I dated the film, but in terms of the information about the crop, that wasn't about crop circles. It was about, um, uh, the 2012, uh, end of the world. <laughs> but, uh, when, when, um, uh, I finished the film. Uh, it, 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 it's the same story. The story about the circles hasn't changed. There hasn't been a new startling development since then that would make you know the the movie I did obsolete in any way. So it's what we call an evergreen, and it's huge claim to fame. As you mentioned, it was uh, well received. It got a really good review in the New York Times. Well, I you know I, it's a good thing I didn't die of a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> that, that that any filmmaker, the dream of any filmmaker making any film is a good review in the New York Times. Yes. And I actually somebody took a video of me as I was opening the paper, and I'm so hysterical in it that I couldn't even put it on Facebook. I look like a mad woman. So, <laughs> so I think that answered your question, Alex. No, no, it, it did. And from a very deep kind of, this is almost too inside baseball to even touch on, but the. Even though the New York Times felt compelled to write a positive review, they did have to slip in that little uh, tip of the hat to the to the mainstream little green men kind of reference. Which I thought it was just just fascinating. It's like, okay, we're going to write a good review, but don't worry, guys, we're still part of the team. It's the little green men thing. But- yeah, well, it was a little, it was I, I took it as charming. I actually called the reviewer to thank her. And um, in the course of the conversation, uh oh, I'm going to, she said, I can't say this, but you know what, we're just chatting now. Uh, uh, I said to her, I, you know, I was so grateful she wrote a good review because so many of people are just skeptical from the, from the get go. It doesn't matter. They're going to, they're going to write the skepticism, whatever they see in front of them. And, and I said that to her, I said, and they're going to say, where's the other side? The other right, side being right. the hoaxers. Like if you had a bank convention, you should have bank robbers there doing your know, testimony. <laughs> no, no, we don't want the hoaxers to have any say. They're 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 terrible. They're the criminals. Da, 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 da. So I said to her, you know, I get this from from critics. You know, where's the other side? And she said, you know, I didn't review the film you didn't make. I reviewed the film you did make. And I thought, oh, that is, may I quote you? She says, no, <laughs> you can only quote my actual review. So we got little green men in there. But it's a sweet review. You know, it's a lovely review. I did want to return to one part of what you talked about, and that is your personal experience, your bio, your background. You know, we were chatting into this just a second ago before we got on the air, and that's that we all have this tendency to talk about our background and weave it together into this tapestry that makes sense. And, oh, you've done this consciousness work in conferences for a long time, and you've evolved into this. But there's another way to read your story. I think you're very open about it on your website. But you kind of tell your whole story. And it's very open, very honest. And what I came away from it was, is this appreciation for how one person in a very humble way, really, as as your approach to this, can really make a difference. And you have made a difference. You've made a difference in these consciousness conferences that you've kind of spearheaded and brought so many people in, and then you've made a a, a substantial difference, a real measurable difference in this crop circle phenomena in bringing that to public awareness, as you just talked about. So one, I want to tip my hat to you and say thank you for doing this kind of work because it's hard. It's not really appreciated a lot of times by a large number of people, and you're going to get a lot of scorn and ridicule that kind of comes with the territory. But tell us anything you can about your personal experience through life, I guess, and why you felt compelled to stick your neck out there in such a way and try and make a difference in this way. I don't, you know, some of us just get a mission, Alex, you know, I don't know, you know, I just have this mission to make the world better. And, um, 
the when I stumbled across the human potential movement many years ago, it was that was the better the world needed to be. You know, we needed to wake up. We needed to see the bigger picture. You know, I'm a Phi Beta Kappa Summa Cum Laude graduate of NYU. I was always good at getting things right. And, um, it, you know, it, it just was my, fa- I'd come home with a 98 and my dad would say, where's the other two points? And he, he was sort of kidding, but, you know, it was a standard. You know, my dad was a big, was the president of his bar association. You know, he, he, he did things well. My mom was president of the women of NYU, which she entered at age 15. In her senior year, she was the president. At the same time, you came to a point that a lot of people don't come to. You came to this wake-up moment and said, gee, I've followed all the cookie crumbs like I'm supposed to, done the right thing, gone to school, gotten married, done this thing, and yet, who am I really? Where am I going? And I think that's a, a brave moment that a lot of people shy away from. They come right up to the edge of that, but then they don't push through to the other side and say, okay, I am more, I do have to try and make a difference. I don't know. It just came with the territory, you know, and it is a very vulnerable place, you know, thank you, sweet, you saying I'm humble, whatever, but I also get shot at a lot. And, um, you know, I can't say as I enjoy that, um, but, uh, but I just accept it, you know, that's, that's the way it goes in this world. And I just keep my sort of fortitude and my strength and I keep moving. And I, I almost don't have any choice. I mean, what can I tell you? You know, um, I, 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 in Los Angeles, my house is a gathering place for the uh, mavericks and people, people sort of like me, more, more, more kind of my audience, actually. It's hard to find the peers who are really out there in this dramatic way trying to really make a difference. And it's a funny time, Alex, I think. Uh, you know, you look around for who are your heroes now, and... Um, it, it, during the whole, uh, from the 60s on with the human potential movement, we had a lot of heroes of gurus and what have you that we looked up to and were helping us and were teaching us. But, you know, you look out now, well, some of those same people are still doing the same thing, I presume impressing new people who come along with just starting to wake up. But in terms of people, I'd be interested to hear who you think is leading any parades now uh, because I love having mentors. I love having people I look up to, but they're hard to find now. Um, uh, I, I mean, is that something, you know, that we can chat about that you can, uh, can I interview you? <laughs> That's a very interesting question. It really, really is because I can relate to what you're saying about this idea of heroes and role models being important in my life as I was growing up and people that I could point to. And so many of those people have really either fallen by the wayside and got out of the game or fallen in a different way that we we no longer see them that way. In fact, we see them as kind of anti-heroes or, or models of, you know, who not to be. Oh, I got all kinds of names running through my head now, but I better not say them. But you're right. I, I, lots of feet of clay out there. Uh, but, you know, I'm even interested in who doesn't have feet of clay and really who I'm always looking for. Who can I? I'll tell you the person that, you know, for, I'll give you mine if you give me yours. Uh, I'll give you mine anyway. But the, the person I, I look up to the most in the world right now is Graham Hancock. Uh, I just love listening to him. Uh, he's so passionate uh, and heartfelt and smart and does the field work, uh, has been in the trenches of, you know, wherever it is that uh, the breakthroughs might come from. Um, I, I just think the world of him, and also of Rupert Sheldrake, who uh, I loved your interview with him that you did, I guess you did it last year when that whole TED thing was erupting. It was such a good piece. I've, I've already passed it along, and I just discovered it recently because I'm involved and in, in, embroiled in TED. So, um, I, you know, I'm, I've got my ears uh, open for uh, interesting things in that category. Your interview with him was absolutely wonderful. You know, you listen to some of those things like that, and you think, oh, get that in front of everyone. You know, such basic truth being spoken, and there's so much uh, gray mass, gray, gray illusion floating around. 
Uh, and then you get this clarity of, of some people who come through. And I guess that's what your show is all about. Uh, but th- those are two of my real heroes. And my, my fundamental hero, even before that, who's been my hero for 30 years. Have you, have you got, uh, ever uh, met or, or gotten involved with or familiar with Brian Swim? Do you know his work? Just a little bit, and I saw him on your website, and, and, and I am aware of him, but, but not as much. I should interview him sometime. Tell me what your, what your thoughts he, are. He's, he's my big hero. He, he's, he's my all-time big hero who doesn't disappoint, doesn't have no clay in his feet. And uh, he's got the story of uh, what this uh, cosmic creation story is, the uh, tagline on his book, The Universe is a Green Dragon, which is, I've, I've bought over a thousand copies of that, Alex. I, it, you can't know me and not have that book handed to you as the kind of basis that we all could agree on as we're, we're, you know, we're not in the Judeo-Christian story anymore. Where, where are we? Mm. What, what, what is... What's the meaning of life? Why are we here? Uh, and that book, to me, and Brian Swim's work, is the just uh, bottom line of not, not uh, the book is not so much objective, this, that, and the other, as it's metaphorical. And you read it, and it, he just, he's brilliant, and he takes you into this visceral understanding of the privilege of being a human being, uh, which really is kind of what you come out with, and not only the privilege, but the responsibility as well. And um, so, you know, I'm big on touting uh, Brian and, and that book. But when I get past those three, you know, I don't know. You, you, you have your tops at all? Well, I was going to say, I mean, I definitely resonate with Rupert Sheldrick, and from the very beginning of this show, um, I, I not only resonated with his work, but then in connecting with him personally, I was really impressed by his openness and his willingness to, to help uh, me. You know, I was, I didn't have any background in this at all. And he was encouraging, and he was open, yeah. and, and in a way that I think I've seen him be with other people along the way, and I think is so vital in this process, you know, because it is growing this little seed of more uh, open people who are trying to figure out some of these big picture questions that have been totally bypassed by mainstream science. And it's really left people, I think, in this really unsettling state of saying, gee, I have these questions. Everyone I know seems to have these questions. Why am I continuously told, oh, don't, don't worry about those questions. Just go out and do your shopping. You know, the famous George Bush line when we were in the Iraq war, you know, don't worry about any of that. Just go out and shop, you know. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that, uh, how nice Rupert Choga is, because I would also say the other two also, they, those are three of the nicest human beings you ever would meet uh, as, you know, persons. And... Uh, so you know, the, that's very nice that they're so nice. You know, they're, they're not going to fall off the pedestals. You know, they're lovely, right. lovely people, just the way it should be. <laughs> yes. Now, listen, I do feel a need to return to our topic of crop circles Oh, what today. were we talking about? Right. No, no, no. no. It, and you it, know it was... what, Alex? I also want to tell people, you mentioned my blog, but I'm in a transition now, and I'm sort of relaunching myself to come back out as the consciousness lady, which is what I was before I became the crop circle queen. So the crop circles are, are one track, but I've gotten too identified with them as if that's my only track. So I'm coming back out with something called Doorway Cafe, and if you got on doorwaycafe.com, you'd see a site that's being uh, put together. We're, we're sort of getting close. Uh, it's not quite done yet, but it's actually live. So anyways, let's return to this topic of crop circles, because it's something that I haven't talked about. And I have to say, when we first connected, I felt the same reservation I think a lot of people do about crop circles. And it's like, oh, my gosh, do we really want to go there? That's so new age-ish. Are you going to pull out, you know, the crystals and the incense next? Not that there's anything wrong with crystals and incense. But it is, <laughs> it, it, it does have this certain stain of, of new age-ishness that maybe shouldn't be there. And I think definitely shouldn't be there after I experienced your, your excellent movie. So... One of the things that I took away that really from, a, from my little skeptical perspective, I'd love to dig into, and that's something you touched on while you were talking about the film initially, and that is the big P 
picture issue here is that crop circles are either a hoax, a complete total hoax, or it's the most profound paradigm shifting. And I love the way you say this in the movie. It's really a close encounter experience that everyone can enjoy, if you will. You know, it's really one of those two. There can be no middle ground. So with that, I think you can then dive in and say, okay, if you're a person who believes that it's a hoax, it's man-made, then great, go for it. But realize what's at stake here. There really is no middle ground, is there? Well, you're absolutely right, and it is because of that, I think, that people are so skeptical. It's too big. It's too, right. you know, way, way, way big. It will change the world. The last time we had a, a, a change of that significance was Galileo. They put him under house arrest for, <laughs> for that shocking news that uh, Earth was not the center of the universe. Thank you, Copernicus. And then Galileo really got it, and, you know, uh, his societies. Um, shunning him. Uh, These are too big. The mind just does not want to shift everything so radically. When we change our juxtaposition to the universe, we change our psyches. I am not a historian to be able to track very uh, specifically how we went from Galileo to here, but I know that at his time, the world was divided into kings and serfs. Uh, It was very uh, top, you know, uh, because we were the center of the universe. It had, it it corresponded to Earth being center of the universe. We were top dog. Uh, And then somehow or other in the course of putting ourselves into uh, the proper juxtaposition of the universe, where we're not so significant, we ended up with democracy here. And I know if I were a historian, I could track that whole uh, evolution of thought, but it has to do with the shift of psyche. And the psyche would shift again if we were not the only intelligence, not in science fiction, but in actuality. If we knew that there was other intelligence contacting us, which the circles do indicate, we would not be top dog again. Another another demotion from from top dog. And look where where we are now. Look at how arrogant we are. Look at how we abuse the earth. Look at how we are violent with one another. We need that. We can use that democratization again on a, another layer of it, where we care about each other, where we're one world. And you know. Uh, if, if indeed, you can just see the, the kind of play of it as it would play out, aside from the psychological effect, uh, if, if, if it were uh, announced by the powers that be, if, if headlines all over the world were, uh, we, have a, uh, we are not alone, uh, uh, contact in, in you know, the way in which we've established we're not alone, that, that's contact of sorts. So contact would be in headlines all over the world. All of a sudden, The whole world is in one conversation. It's the most fascinating thing that's ever happened. It won't go away. It's not today's news cycle. It'll be with us forever. We're talking to each other. We're equalized here on Earth as one humanity dealing with the other. So, you know, you can just see it play out in mind's eye. How good that would be for us. Well, maybe, right? I mean, I'm with you right up until the end because we don't know what the consequences are would be of that. And there's also another part. There's a couple of different parts that I'd pull out of that. One is that I think it's interesting to, you know, really dig into explore what that means when we say this would be paradigm shifting, this would change everything, and then look at that relative to how people deal with this topic. And I'm guilty of it as well as I just admitted. And I guess what I'm getting at is something that I've experienced over and over again. And that's that I think people have an intuitive knowing and an intuitive protection mechanism that doesn't allow them to go to these topics because they do realize what they mean without even realizing it. I think people turn away from the crop circle thing, laugh it off, do, I I love the quote from John Mack in your movie where he says, hey, the worst thing, especially for an American, an American male, I can say, is to be duped, to be conned. And there's that resistance, like, I don't want to be conned, but there's also this element of, I don't want to go there because somewhere in my head, at some level, I realize the impact that this will have. I've seen the same thing with religious folks, you know, when you start really pulling apart 
Christianity or any any religion, and you start pointing out just the ridiculousness of some of the, the historical evidence, then there's just this, I don't want to go there because I've already thought through the chain of events and where that would lead along the same lines of what you're talking about. So I, I wonder if you have any thoughts about these two worlds that we live in, the world of what could be and what we do know is the potential for change and the potential for radical paradigm shift and how we balance that with the comfort and security we have that, hey, everything is going to be okay. You know, my life, as you talk about in, in your life story and in your kind of very domestic, ordinary life, and then, you know, what it took for you to break out of that, I think there's a parallel there that most people reach that same point that this crop circle phenomena pushes you to, and then they turn back and go, no, 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 that's okay. Let me go back to kind of my normal life. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I, I think you've said it all. It's, it's absolutely right. It's too radical. And, you know, we, this is a very complex world we're living in. There's a lot of gears that are meshed to have it working the way it's working. Yes. Uh, including a power structure that, yes. you know, is very happy to have it working that way. Insists, demands can only operate if it works that way. And that's one of the things that I wanted to pick on. I'm sorry to jump in there, but it's it's such a important point to me. And that's that when we look for governments to make a proclamation of disclosure on UFOs, when we look for governments to resolve the ridiculous science versus religion thing, or even we, we look for governments to step in and say, uh, in some way that, you know, this materialistic paradigm that says we can just go and consume and do to no end, that that really has to come to an end. If we're expecting that, we're expecting the machine to turn around and eat itself. Because the only way this culture, this machine that we've built can go forward is in the way that it's going forward. That's my opinion. I don't look for the big change, the big transformation. The gears, like you said, are too intricately engineered to operate within each other. And there's too many people who love the game just the way it is to really expect this to change. Well, I would make a couple of comments about that. Um, one would be that, um, you know, you're absolutely right that, that um, things would be really radically disrupted the psyche it, it, it resists that. We, we're just not ready to, to make those leaps. They're too big. But the other thing is that look at the state we're in. You know, we're not in Ozzy and Harriet land. Everyone knows that we're in deep trouble. And so when the crop circles came along in my reality, where I was interested in this shift and how it might come about, uh, at the same time as we resist the radical change, we need that radical change. We need something that jars this gear mechanism that's so tightly meshed. Little things don't, you know, it's fingers in the dike. Uh, but we need something to really make us think again about everything. And, you know, the circle, the crop circles could do that. We're so really... Uh, foolish not to be curious about them because they could be so helpful to us. Uh, but um, uh, at least we do know that we, we are not in uh, uh, smooth times, you know, that we are hitting a wall, that there's talk about humanity destroying itself. I mean, boy, that's sort of new on the table. And in the face of that, uh, my goodness, let's look to all of these uh, radical possibilities. I'm going to have something on my website uh, on Doorway Cafe that's going to be uh, thinking outside the box, and I've, I've primed it with a few of my thoughts about what radical things might happen to upend everything, and I'm, gonna in I'm inviting uh, submissions for other people's ideas about what those things could be. We should be talking that way. That's the kind of talk we should be engaging in. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I agree. And, you know, at the same time, you know, we, this is such a wonderful conversation, and, and it could be so 
far flung, I guess, that I, I always feel a need to kind of pull it back because I do have to tell you, my, again, return to my experience in watching your film was one of just a lot of new information. And I almost felt a little bit embarrassed. I'm like, gee, why don't I know more about this? Oh, well, your media has not been kind to you, Alex. You know, the media does not uh, bring you uh, the, the latest news from the front of crop circles. They're very cynical and very skeptical, and mostly they ignore them. But when they do, you know, do something, uh, it's always with that sort of sly wink, you know, of ha ha ha, you know. And the other part of it is that even though I was aware of some of the information that you provided in the film about some of the scientific evidence about the bending of the crops and, and some of the ideas about the scope and some of the ideas about debunking the debunkers. I think what your film does for anyone who hasn't done a comprehensive review of this phenomena is it lays it out in a very systematic way that someone can go through it. And I want to bring a little bit of that to our audience so that they can have some of that. And let's return to this idea that we both felt comfortable with is that the big picture here is that, folks, this is either a hoax or it is an enormously important paradigm-shifting close encounter. There's no other way to explain it. We have this phenomena that you can reach out and touch in these fields, and it's happening at a scale that we can't explain. So we either have to explain it in conventional means, or we have to jump over to the other side and say, this is totally beyond our ability to explain it. So... Let's debunk the debunkers. Lay out what they have to overcome, the evidence that they have to overcome in order to advance their theory. And their theory, again, let's be clear, is that each and every crop circle formation throughout time that they've been recorded, every one of those is a hoax, right? That's how. That's the burden of proof that they have. If there are any who are not, or sus we suspect that are not, then that theory has to kind of fall away. So let me pick this one piece out of the film that I thought was quite extraordinary and quite new to me. And before I dive into it, tell us about the journal Nature, the scientific journal Nature, and the publication in 1880 and what it contained. Every hundred years or so in the media of the day, whatever it was, starting in 1678 with the first time in a woodcut, uh, in a pamphlet, uh, we had a picture of a crop circle and a little story. We always date what was the first time you ever saw a crop circle referred to. And it's this uh, little 1678 woodcut. If you, uh, it's called the mowing devil. It's come to be called. And it's all over the net if you want to look it up. So the 1891 where, um, a scientist, uh, was in, uh, a field in England and he's reporting out circles everywhere. It's as I say, the evidence is much, is in favor of it being a mystery. Uh, even though it's counterintuitive, you think, oh, no, that's too big. Well, wait a minute. Sorry about that. It is. The evidence does point in that direction. That's one of the reasons I return, I take people back to this 1880 publication in Nature, because besides the, the date, which is stunning for most folks like me who've whether we want to or not, have been susceptible to the the skeptical hoaxer kind of idea. If you're going to explain this as a human phenomena, as a hoax, then you have to go back and explain, for example, this, this observation by J. Rand Capron, this guy in England who is a well-known scientist. What I found striking is he's in very detailed terms talks about the phenomena in some of the same ways that you've investigated it, that investigated it and tell people about in the movie that this is clearly not a man-made phenomena because the way the wheat in this case is laid down and placed in this kind of pattern like it's just pushed down and it's not broken and it swirls around. And here this guy in 1880, he's describing exactly the kind of phenomena that you describe in the movie and how people can tell almost at first sight whether this was a man-made crop circle or whether it couldn't be explained in those kind of conventional terms. But I'll tell you, Alex, also in recent years, um, it, earlier on in our modern phenomenon, you know, you could indeed look and say, oh, no, that, that's a slobby mess. That, uh, that's hoax. 
they, if you, you asked one of the original hoaxers, well, what about geometry, which the circles are brilliant at? And they said, what? What's that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, so they were just laying down, you know, uh, sloppy patterns. But uh, the, over the years, the hoaxers have gotten much better at flattening crop. Uh, they've gotten good geometers. The shapes are good. Um, so you have to look to look beyond the obvious, uh, the most obvious, to ascertain whether you whether you're dealing with a real one or not. But again, Susanna, I I, I look at it from a historical perspective. Okay, great. The hoaxers have evolved. Why yeah. would we then say that in 1880 you know, the hoaxers had evolved to this extent? That doesn't fit. That doesn't make a lot of sense. And again, all well, it also doesn't make sense that you know your cell phones stop working and your batteries that were fully charged are drained inside a circle. I mean, you've got yeah. Tell us about the physical electrical effects that have been observed by some people who are well qualified to to see whether that's really happening. I mean, that's a pretty easy observation to make, but particularly for someone who has a little bit of skill in electronics, they can say, wow, you know, I walked inside the circle and the camera went dead. I walked outside of it. The camera came alive. Same with my cell phone. There's There's a lot of that going on, isn't there? Exactly. Well, the batteries don't recharge, but um, the cell phone will not work in a circle, not always, but, you know, enough, enough. Uh, and then you hold it out over the edge of the, where the standing crop is in the, in the field. It'll, it'll, it'll be working. Uh, the batteries that drain and the cameras don't come back. Uh, we have one um, story we tell in the movie of a camera crew from uh, television that came back to the studio, and this was earlier on when they were shooting film, and they had nothing on the film, white light. Uh, so there's so much of that electromagnetic interference going on in the circles that, uh, you know, something's going on. There's some kind of energy in there that you can't account for in any of the terms that we understand how science works. Uh, so you have the, the kind of things that happen inside the circles themselves, including things like braided uh, crop. It's not just laid down. In some in some instances, it's very intricately braided. I mean, what? You're going to have little weavers sitting on the ground there in the four hours of English darkness braiding the crop? I don't think so. So you have the things that are the physical evidence uh, or physical anomalies, uh, in the circles, and then you've got what happens in, you know, the results of, of laboratory analysis. Um, the, the, it was a stunning uh, lab work that was done uh, on the soil inside a crop circle where they ascertained that the crystalline structure of one of the elements in the soil uh, does not occur on Earth, uh, on the surface soil. And in fact, that you could expect that crystalline structure uh, to be hundreds of miles way down deep beneath the crust where uh, the pressure from the top and the heat from the bottom had cooked it for millions of years, and you'd expect that kind of crystalline structure. And there it was on the surface soil inside a crop circle. So, you know, you look at stuff like that and you go, wait a minute, this is beyond anecdotal or somebody's particular story. One of the reasons I, I, I was never particularly a UFO. I wasn't a UFO person any more than, you know, the next guy in the diner. Uh, because it was so uh, ephemeral, you know, somebody would say, I saw, and then, well, where is it? You know, who knows? Did they, didn't they? But the circles are there. They stay there until the crop is harvested. Uh, you can examine the material. You can uh, have, you know, actual physical evidence and so that's why uh, it intrigued me so much, uh, where, where the UFOs never attracted me, you know, as, as a field of study or uh, something to, you know, spread the word about. Uh, but the circles were different. The circles we actually could, could get to proof, you know. But now what we need is attention. Uh, proof proof uh, is one thing, but if any, people have to know that the proof exists. And, of course, that's why I made these movies. Yes, yes, excellent. I, I just want to touch on one more aspect of the proof that I pulled out from the movie that, that really struck me, and I, I just want people to be aware of, and that's the overall scale of this. So again, if you want to advance the hoaxer theory that each and every one of these are a hoax, you also have to account for, one, the, the scale of these complex 
creations. So anyone who goes in, online and looks at photography or watches, again, the excellent cinematography in your movie and the, the just stunningly beautiful crop circles that are in it, you have to explain how, like in one instance, 35 of these <laughs> could be created overnight in South England. I mean, you are talking about an army of people, an army of well-organized hoaxers that have incredibly advanced knowledge of geometry, of artistry, and are so committed to this, and yet remain completely anonymous. Because think about that. How many people would it take to create 35 crop circles, and how would you keep them all silent about doing it? Well, all the, all perfect questions. And look at the biggest one ever, uh, which was in 2001. Um, it's the size of, now you have to picture two football fields. Um, there are 409 separate circles. Uh, many of the crop circles are composed of other kind of shapes as well. This one happened to be all circles uh, in, a, in a very um, uh, sophisticated geometric pattern. No mistakes. Everything. So you think an army would have just for that particular formation, it would have taken an army to do, uh, presuming they could have. Uh, and y you know, you're talking about four or five hours of darkness at night because they'll be seen in the fields if uh, they're doing it in the daytime. Well, it boggles the mind. You know, it just boggles the mind. You can't. Well, you can't. You know, that cannot be. So even though the mind wants to say, ah, all people, when you look at the evidence, uh, it's more clearly in favor of the fact that there's a mystery uh, over the fact that people have made. You cannot explain this away. Yes. Okay. Um, enough on the on the hoaxers. But I, 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 actually, I don't think we can even spend enough time, but maybe we have for this interview. Because... Uh, again, we just have to hammer this home again and again, is that the phenomena demands an explanation in one of two ways, man-made hoaxing or paradigm shifting close encounter. There's nothing in between here, folks, and just keep drilling that over and over again and then ask all these questions of how you would prove it to be a hoax and then ask the next layer of questions that we were getting into before, which is one what is this then? What does this really say? Why are these being created by this other consciousness, this other intelligence that's out there? And you spend a good deal of time in the movie, Suzanne, talking about the why question. I'm not totally synced up with you on all the ideas you have, but let's spend some time talking about this. Why are the crop circles there? Well, of course, you're now in pure speculation because nobody's telling us. Uh, that whatever is delivering them is not giving us the explanation for why or where they come from or, you know, and it's not necessarily um, uh, extraterrestrial. Maybe it's another dimension. I mean, who, who, we just don't know. We've never identified anything that can function like us other than us. And who knows, uh, you know, what, where, where it is coming from. As I say, all you can do is say, not us. Um, uh, and why? Well, we're, uh, speculation. So you'll hear, m this is mine. Uh, mine is, first of all, some kind of underlying Star Trek uh, uh, idea that you can't get interfered with by uh, other uh, entities in the universe that come along and save you. That That's not the nature of reality. Uh, but um, the the my my speculation is that we're being helped. Uh, at, we're being helped by evidence that there is otherness, and that that's all we need. We don't because you know each formation actually uh, many of them, the good ones, have uh, information encoded in them. You can get formulas out of them. You can get geometric relationships out of them. You can get events on Earth that they're pointing to out of them. Uh, and people will say, "Well, what's the message? What's the message?" As if some maybe it's a jigsaw puzzle, and we'll put them all together and we'll get, or it's hieroglyphics if we can translate them. 
I, I don't think so. I think we're being bombarded with evidence that there is otherness, and that's all we need. We don't need them to tell us what to do or, you know, give us any specific instruction or... Uh, although who knows if we were really uh, accepting the fact that there was other intelligence, we were open to it, who knows what they could do to help us. Uh, They're obviously more advanced than we are because they're visiting us, we're not visiting them. But just the fact of there being an otherness would be so changeful to us at a time uh, in history when we're getting worse and worse at managing our world and we need, you know, some radical new, new, new premises uh, and I think that this is a, just a steady bombardment, uh, not too radical that, you know, people are going to become shocked and alarmed and something is out there, but gradually, you know, delivering and delivering and delivering and more and more people like me, whatever, saying, pay attention, pay attention. And, and at some point, some, you know, hopeful uh, authority or breakthrough or, or investigative reporter or something comes along that says, wait a minute. Everyone, pay attention. And, you know, we've been seasoned then. We've been, you know, it's been a while that we've been uh, adjusting at, uh, at some level of, of, you know, there's lots of people who are paying attention to the crop circles, nowhere near the majority, but not just a few people either. Uh, it's a very, very intriguing phenomenon that has a lot of people paying attention to it. You know, I think it's interesting. I, I love how you framed it up as speculation, 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 and that's all we can do. And I also like the fact that you stay grounded in the fact that the real paradigm buster is the otherness. So there is this otherness beyond us, and that once you jump over that chasm, you you can kind of figure out the rest. One, what you'll you'll figure it out your way, however that way is. But you will have left behind the kind of hypnotic trance that we're told. You know, just go out and shop, and that's all you need to do, and just take care of your material needs. But a couple of things that you said in there do resonate with some of the explorations we've done in extended human consciousness, be it through. Uh, near-death experience or medium communication or even uh, psychedelic experiences that people have. And and a couple things I'd point out is that, one, the messages that we get from the other, from the greater, from the more, aren't usually clear, definitive (laughs) messages that we can bring back and share with everyone as, you know, this is it, this is the this is the tablet that I got from the mountain, and here are the 10 rules that we have to live with. Whatever we can say about what this ultimate reality is and these ultimate truths are, we can say that it doesn't seem to come down like that. There's a lot of con- contradictory or apparent contradictory information here. So I think when people try and pull apart the crop circle phenomena and discredit it by saying, well, you know, why would they say this and why would they square the circle and what does that mean versus this? It's like, you know, maybe we're not supposed to be able to, like you, I love the way you said it, put it all together as a jigsaw puzzle like we'd like to and say, there, we've solved it. Do you have any thoughts on our need to look for a message when when really the message has to come from within, ultimately. It has to resonate with something deep inside of us. And this is my opinion. This is really about personal transformation as much or more than it's about group or collective transformation. Because really, you can't have one without the other, but it has to start with the personal transformation. Well, I'm not so sure, Alex. We might have a little disagreement there. I have this feeling that, no, it's not about person. I mean, all that growth work we do, whatever, examining ourselves... But if this, um, this is a, sort of more on the surface of, oh my goodness, you know, hitting us over the head if attention is called to it, and we are told uh, because they paid attention that something inexplicable is going on. And then I think it sort of filters down into your being of, you know, your mind is now in a different place. You've been affected. And, um, Something so different than what your whole life, you know, uh, perspective has been is going on, and you just have to kind of swallow it and deal with it and think about it and what have you. And, and um, you know, I just love the idea that 
uh, it creates us as one. It creates us as one humanity in relation to the other because that's really that's what we need. Once we really care about our mutuality as much as we care about our individuality, uh, we'll change the world. Uh, that's the world that needs to change. And, um, you know, the circles are uh, such a wonderful possibility. You know, you're you're saying all those other things that are going on, you can't pin them down and nail them down and show them as evidence. They're too ephemeral. They're too individualistic. But but it's exactly why I, I, I the circles grab me as these other things that I'm all in, I'm interested in all of them. I mean, we could talk a lot about all that. I mean, I'm deeply steeped in consciousness kind of work. Uh, but those circles present a, a, a unique opportunity in the hard material world to give us the evidence of the bigger picture that we're all part of. Um, and, you know, the, the people who are enthusiastic about the circles who know as much as I know, I mean, our hearts are just melted from this, really. And, and you know, that's what could happen to everyone. So wouldn't that be a consummation devoutly to be wished for, as I believe w- Willie the Shakes said once? <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a p- very good point, and I'm glad that you made it. And I do have to kind of swing around and and agree with you and, and acknowledge what you're saying because you're right. The phenomena, the way it manifests itself is very public, very much about collective group experience. And in that way, it's different. It's very different. It's very different than uh, most abduction experiences. Abduction is kind of a challenging word, but it's the one that we have. It's different than near-death experiences, although some of those have some group aspect to it. That's not the that's not the overwhelming majority. It's it's far the, the minority of the experiences. And yet you're right. You're right. I hadn't really thought about it that way. But this is by its very nature, we can't say I almost said by its design, but we don't know that. But by its nature, it is a group experience. It is a collective experience. It is a community experience to have these things out there like that, isn't it? Well, exactly. It's very unique. There's nothing really quite like this. And uh, as I say, it's why I got so fascinated with it. And uh, I still, you know, just hold hope that, uh, you know, my movie, which is called What on Earth, um, is very well known in the whole UFO underground world. Um, Everybody knows this movie. But getting it out to the mainstream uh, is still a challenge. Uh, I'm still, you know, trying who, who, well, you know, get, well, Rosie O'Donnell, uh, if she were ongoing and had her TV show, she was my champion. But she's not out there, you know, making noise anymore. I could use one noisemaker. It is odd that there's nobody from the showbiz world uh, that really, she was fascinated by him having seen my movie. Uh, but you know, there it is. People visit all the time. How come we haven't had any big celebrities over there? I take a celebrity. It doesn't matter. Somebody who people are paying attention to, get on a soapbox and say, hey, world, pay attention to this, you know? So I'm still looking for my champion out there. So if anybody's listening who wants to be my champion, be in touch. So, you know, maybe as the last topic we can touch on, let's pick up on what you just said, because we can't get this far into this whole phenomena, the experience that it is for so many people, and then not address the deliberate misinformation, the deliberate willful ignorance on the part of so many people that are in the mainstream media, the power structure, whatever we want to call it, that that how can this be ignored? And then how can we possibly believe that that is not a, a systematic effort? to ignore, to distract, to, to direct people away from this phenomena. What do you make of that? Well, of course, that is an interesting topic. And um, the um, we, we go into some detail in the movie about the big uh, shift that happened in, in human uh, perception about this. Because when the phenomenon was first juicy, back in the 1980s and uh, 1990s, uh, the 1990s, the, the world was quite fascinated by what was going on. It, it, was, it was making news. Um, it, and 
then all of a sudden we still have, you know, people still today who say, oh, no, those two guys in England, those farmers, they, they made them all. They confessed. That was in 2001. Uh, well, um, so we go into the story of Doug and Dave, still infamous, and, and th- those names are very familiar with uh, many people in the public, uh, because all of a sudden a press release went all over the world that said these two guys had made them all. Well, if you stop to think about the illogic of that, these are two little farmers in England from nowhere. And all of a sudden there's a press release that got into newspapers all over the world that debunked it. Well, we we go into some detail in the movie about that and uh, tracking where that press release came from. And it does seem to have come from the Ministry of Defense when you track back to some layers of illusion about a PR firm and what have you. Uh, so there was uh, some apparently concerted effort on the part of the uh, powers that be to divert attention. And it doesn't take much to divert attention from something as groundbreaking and earth-shattering as this. Uh, oh, yeah, good. Oh, we don't have to think about that anymore. That's been explained. Those two guys did it. And that story, you know, really set the world on a different course. And ever since then, skepticism has outweighed curiosity. Uh, but, you know, I don't know, Alex. I often wonder about government um, interference with all these things, with the UFO things. And the UFO crowd is very convinced that there's a uh, campaign, a very concerted campaign on the part of the government to suppress this information. Oh, the evidence is overwhelming. I mean, the evidence of it happening right now, we don't have as much, but all we have to do is look back 30 or 40 years in the declassified document. It's clear. And then the question that one would have to ask is, why would we assume that any of that has slowed down or stopped? And what evidence do we have that if our intelligence organizations were manufacturing the data, hiring uh, academicians hiring people in at universities to kind of misdirect, misinform people. Why would we think any of that stopped? I mean, and I think the same is true here. But please go ahead. Well, you know, you know, I wanted to say something about my thoughts about this whole idea of government suppression. I think that perhaps we have a lot more romantic idea about. Uh, the force of the government and they're conspiring against these far out kind of things. I think government's probably more chaotic than that. I don't even know that there's a real department or a focus or whatever. Uh, there have been some incidents like the uh, disinformation that went out about Doug and Dave and uh, we have the Robertson panel uh, back in the early UFO days which decided that they didn't know what was going on and that the world was curious and concerned and if they said they didn't know what was going on, the world would really be concerned so that the uh, actual administrative decision on the part of government was to debunk it, to laugh at it, to ridicule it whenever it came up. Uh, and that does not seem to have been rescinded at any point, but I don't know that there's ever been really a focus on that. I think that decision just colored the air way back when. I think that was in the 50s, early 50s. And, uh, and I think that's just been you know, the, 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 the sort of uh, milieu of, of policy rather than any, you know, back room where everybody's deciding to put down the UFOs and put down the crop circles, you know. Oh, agreed. Uh, he, agreed, totally agree. And I, I think some that, people think that. Some people think that, well, you know, the disclosure think... has to be of some body of information that's being kept together. And I, I don't know, I'm not so sure that's true at all. I think that misunderstanding of the nature of power and influence just conspires to create this this misinformation. Now, I just got done interviewing not too long ago, Russ Baker, who is an investigative journalist, best-selling author of the book about the Bush dynasty. Yes, you know, I helped, I helped Russ with his uh, website. Well, that's fantastic. And, and what I think is interesting who, what, about Russ... When, is that what it's called? Who, what, when, something yes, like that? Yes, it's, who, yeah. what, when. That's great. Well, Russ Baker was kind of a, a kind of a sidestep for me and Skeptico because I pretty stay, stay pretty close to the consciousness issue. But I do think I have to return to this idea of conspiracies because we have to understand how these things happen if we're ever going to unravel this. And a couple of things we've talked about here, I think, are important in that, you know, it doesn't take a a tightly knit large group of people in a back smoky room to, to do these things. It takes one or two people to give 
a nudge here, a wink there to approve this, to kind of throw a little bit of paint on this thing. And then the machine kind of works the way that it works without a lot of without a lot of help and the the nincompoopery of the, the system only only helps it because then everyone says well gee look how incompetent this organization is this government is this agency is how could it possibly create this huge you know a well-organized conspiracy no it doesn't it's it's going to happen one way or another you just need a couple of well-placed people to sit back let things play out. And when things don't quite play out the way you want, boy, you just nudge it over this way. I, I heard an interview, and we're getting far afield, but that's okay. But I heard an interview, and it was really a wonderful archive interview with Timothy Leary. Of course, the famous... Oh, yes, one of my favorites from way back, yeah. <laughs> yes, the, the, the Harvard psychiatrist who pioneered the use of LSD and, and really created a whole social revolution. To, what was it? Turn on, tune in, and drop out, you know, was the whole thing. And what, what he said, which I thought was, was, was stunning but relevant, he goes, you know, we didn't realize for the longest time, I didn't realize till it was all over and I was in jail, that I had been infiltrated, I had been co-opted early on, you know. And I think that's the kind of stuff that we don't fully work into the whole conspiracy thing. So you're Timothy Leary and you're going, hey man, this is great. We're going to change the world, you know, rack closet. And you, you're you sitting right next, you're dropping acid with the guy from the FBI right next to you from the get-go. So, you know, I, I, I think a deeper understanding of the true nature of power, control, influence, and the way that it manifests itself in these engineered conspiracies is important to really understanding this whole thing. And we return to crop circles. There is no other way to explain the stunning lack of interest, stunning lack of interest, because as you say, these things are right there in our face and there's no journalists there. There's no news teams there. I mean, that deserves explanation at a much more, uh, you know, deeper, this conspiratorial kind of level. Well, you know, one of the things that uh, we can uh, add to that uh, rundown, you know, that quite accurate from my point of view that you were doing, uh, is that the way news works is uh, it runs on events. Uh, so when you have a phenomenon that is uh, ongoing and it's not a single event, it tends also, there's a whole other kind of track, it tends to be ignored. Uh, when, for instance, that largest one ever appeared, uh, CNN was there. That was that was an event, you know. Uh, but by and large, the phenomenon just keeps on keeping on and delivering fascinating, delicious, wonderful, uh, intriguing, uh, but but not unique, you know, as the kind of thing that the news media is set up for. So you have that kind of uh, added. Uh, uh, kind of um, uh, element that keeps this thing from really being reported on. Uh, so, you know, you have a lot of things conspiring at once in a kind of an innocent conspiracy uh, to keep the things out of the public eye that really should be there. Well, Suzanne, your work is, is amazing and should be praised, and I'm here to praise it. Tell us, you've told us a little bit about some of the new projects you're working on and how your work is broadening to talk about, which it has for a long time, but it's broadening to focus on consciousness issues in general, as well as crop circles. Tell us about what's going on with you in the future and where people can find out more about what you're doing. Well, Doorway Cafe is my new website, doorwayfatcafe.com, Suzanne's Doorway Cafe, but doorwaycafe.com is the URL. And, um, you know, uh, I'm uh, interested in how we are going to get out of this constricted, selfish, uh, self-centered kind of uh, worldview to where we are one humanity. Uh, it's just the, the most important thing to be doing. Every issue, solving global warming and solving oil depletion and solving, you know, all the things that challenge us are being held in place by our worldview. Uh, we're greed, pops compassion. And so I'm interested in all the ways that uh, potentially we can break through, and there'll be different tracks there. You know, one of my big tracks uh, 
that uh, I've been on for the last year is this TED situation, and I know you've done uh, other shows about it, and people can learn more about that if they get on Doorway Cafe. Uh, but the, TED became very repressive after uh, uh, thinking of it as the icon of intellect, and uh, last year they, they, they fell under the influence of the uh, uh, fundamentalist scientism folk, uh, the uh, athe- materialist atheists, they have all these labels for them. Uh, at any rate, they're the repressive fundamentalists who are holding us back from thinking these thoughts uh, beyond scientific materialism. And um, Ted became influenced by them. And um, you did a wonderful show with Rupert Sheldrake at the time that was going on. He was one of their uh, targets and Graham Hancock was the second target of theirs, and I, producing TEDx West Hollywood, was the third target. And it becomes an arena for examining not just uh, criticizing TED, which you know it does have this shadow side and it should be criticized. Uh, and if we're going to hold it up as an icon of intellectual thought, well, let's have it be uh, representative of the highest thought and not of fundamentalist thought. Uh, and that's why, you know, it's a good arena for, it's a microcosm of what's going on in the world where we need to get off this narrow perspective and uh, Ted being so visible, if Ted says, wait a minute, let us reconsider what ideas indeed are ideas worth spreading, which is their motto, uh, and that we have been too restrictive about our acceptance of uh, things that are more outside of ordinary reality, which Science itself and this whole quantum world, science is ahead. Uh, the, the scientists at the edge are really ahead of the mainstream, and Ted has uh, favored uh, this mainstream perspective. So, so Ted is a big category for me, uh, having both at a personal level suffered from their restrictive policies where midstream they canceled my license actually when I was ready to put my event on two weeks before uh, after a year of working on it they canceled my license and uh, it, an outcry uh, occurred because they were already an outcry about what they had done to Sheldrake and Hancock and so the you know us three victims um, are actually the opportunity for TED to re-examine itself and as such become the kind of platform for the world to take another look at what it considers uh, acceptable, uh, whereby we can really deal with this worldview that's keeping us in this very restricted and unpropitious place uh, where we are not in the best position to solve all the problems that challenge us, and we need to be. So that's a big arena for me. Uh, and the crop circles, of course, you know, ongoingly, I, you know, got my stake in them as another thing to pay attention to. And then you'll find all kinds of other uh, entertainments and amusements along the road to the next reality, which is our little tagline. Well, great. Sign me up or I will sign myself up at Doorway Cafe. So so that's terrific, Suzanne. I admire your, your work greatly. I love your optimism. I can't share it. I don't see any way to turn Ted around. Or I just think that's, that's, you know, maybe there's some thing to be gained by just the effort in doing it. But I think you're you're deep inside the belly of the beast there. But hey, we'll just follow your follow your journey. And I sure hope you prove me wrong. It's been great having you on the show. I do hope everyone checks out Doorway Cafe. Suzanne, thanks again so much for joining me on Skeptico. Thanks again to Suzanne Taylor for joining me today on Skeptico. As you can tell, I'm really impressed with Suzanne's work, and in particular, her dedication to this work, her willingness to continue to pursue this and not grow weary, but instead continue to find fresh, new angles to pursue this very, very important topic. So, I just have one question to tee up from this interview, and it's just the basic question, what do you make of crop circles? And in particular, one of the things that I stumbled across that I didn't really spend a lot of time, but I did find very interesting, is the debunking of the debunking that's been done with crop circles. That is, the work that's been done by some researchers to follow up on folks who claim to be the hoaxers 
And what they've shown in many of these cases is that the story of hoaxing just doesn't hold up. Either they're direct witnesses who contradict the crop circle hoaxers. So a hoaxer will say, yeah, we did that last night in the field from 10 to 3 a.m. in the morning. Then there'll be a security guard who says, yeah, I was by the field at 1230. There was no one there. And, and another person says, I live in that town and, and was up at 2 a.m. in the morning and looked down on that field and there was nothing there. So there's been some interesting work in debunking the hoaxers, which puts a whole other spin on this in terms of raising the question, where is this hoaxing information coming from? So jump in there. Let me know what you think about crop circles. Of course, the place to do that is through the Skeptico website, which you can find at skeptico.com. You can leave a comment right there or jump on over to the forum and tell us what you think there. While you're at the Skeptico website, be sure to subscribe on iTunes or download directly any of our over 250 previous episodes of Skeptico. I've had some nice emails lately of folks who are digging into the library, the archive, going back and listening to all these shows. And as I've told you many times, there's nothing more satisfying to me and rewarding than to hear of folks who are sharing this journey that I've taken with me and are finding value in listening to this library of old shows. So I think that's just terrific. And I want to thank you again, all of you, for the contribution you've made to I guess it sounds kind of hokey, but really my life and how much Skeptico has really affected me and affected my my worldview and my relationships with just about everyone who's most important to me in my life. So I have you, the Skeptico audience, to thank for that and for helping me make that possible. So I don't think I say thank you enough, and I wanted to do that here. So that's going to do it for this episode. I have a number of interesting interviews coming up. Many of you are helping me line up and direct me towards those interviews, which I think is a great process that I enjoy. I am pretty well booked up through the next few months, so you might hold off on some of those suggestions for a while, and then we'll get a new batch of them later in the fall. Well, again, that's going to do it for today. Do take care and bye for now.